I have been part of the Kitty VDG, the visual design team, for many, many years, though I'm not very active there anymore. Nonetheless, as a quick metric, I've written more than 16,000 messages in the VDG chat, and I'm still somewhat in the loop as far as design goes. I've never been part of the GNOME design team though. That said, Tobias Bernard has uh, recently had a talk called GNOME Design, a report from the trenches, which gives us some insight into that group. I have also done some further research and I'll do my best, as far as I can do that, to accurately, accurately represent their processes. So let's start with the teams themselves. On the GNOME side of things, there's a design team, and according to Tobias, it's currently composed of 5 to 10 people, depending on how you count them, with a mix of full-time employees and volunteers, and it has been somewhat stable over time. As a rough explanation of how the design team operates with a larger context of GNOME, Tobias explains that at the core there are the modules, such as the desktop and the apps, and there are some uh, other contributors on the outside and other teams that coordinate specific areas. If a change that affects the UX is required, the design team is involved in some way and everyone understands that to be the case, which, believe me, is not worthy. Simple enough, on the KDE side of things, we have the Visual Design Group or VDG. It's been around for various years and akin to the three-body problem, it has a stable years with various active contributors and chaotic years where the situation is not as good. I think we're currently in a chaotic era. There's no one that's specific to the VDG and all of those working within it are application or uh, shell developers that are somewhat reinvented themselves to be also designers out of need. Formerly around 30 people are su subscribed to the group, but it doesn't feel like so. We cer certainly don't have anyone uh, working full time on it. Due to, sorry, I'm still a bit sick, that's why my voice is bad. Due to this bad side of things, in my opinion, a second design team has formed within KDE, and it's called KDE Next. I did a video about the project a few months ago. They tr described themselves as a designer-led effort to revamp KDE's plasma desktop. We share mockups, ideas, design thoughts. We also work on icons, design systems, and much more. Plasma X has one to two regularly active members and a few more occasional volunteers. They're still all volunteers, which limits the amount of available time to them. The de facto the theme is driven forward by Andy, who's the only designer, only regularly active person in KDE right now, which isn't great. Now, it's easy to make fun of KDE saying things like, you can see that there's no design team, but that wouldn't be very honest. This situation is somewhat recent, and just a few years ago, the visual design team was much more active, and uh, great design work was done, I think. Some of the people who were in the VDG are still active KDE contributors, though they interact in other spaces. Both GNOME and KDE heavily use Matrix and GitLab for internal communication within the two teams. But GNOME does it better. The design team on GitLab has dozens of projects, ranging from apps to system mockups to resources helpful to creating mockups to sounds, icon references, and more. This work as a somewhat centralized source of design information and references. There's a place to see how other designers intended components and from which developers can take inspirations. There's also uh, SVG files with templates, however, these aren't kept up to date. And when a designer uses Inkscape for their designs, they generally copy assets they've already made in previous mockups instead of a template file. This somewhat raises the barrier to entry for designers. The GNOME design team also holds weekly calls to discuss plans for the future, open merge requests, big initiatives, design proposals, and so on. And even better, the notes for each call are archived in a design calls folder within the, you guessed it, same GitLab theme, so everybody can see them. By contrast, the KDVG VDG GitLab um, only holds two projects, issues and device assets. 
The former is used for design discussions and it details a precise decision-making process. For each issue, there's a facilitator assigned by the theme and there's a discussion for three weeks. At the end of that, a decision is taken either by consensus or by voting, still through the facilitator. That said, I'm really sorry about my voice. That said, I haven't personally seen this process much in action. Most of the issues are currently hanging uh, from proposed redesigns, user requests, and so on. Only a few are actively in discussion. The device assets repository on the other end is completely empty. Whoops. As mentioned, both projects also use Matrix as the official communication channel. That said, it's uh, worth noting that KDE's VDG is also bridged to Telegram, which may, might make it a bit easier to join if you've already got an account there. It sure helped me a lot to get involved. I have be uh, I've briefly uh, discussed mockups, which applications are used to create them. Well, as far as I understood it, both KDE and GNOME are in the same boat here, so I'll make a general overview. Currently, there's no clear standard to design applications in free and open source world. One uh, appealing option, which is the one I usually go for myself, is Inkscape. Indeed, you can see that the mockup files provided by GNOME again outdated but still they exist, are SVGs and they also offer Inkscape tutorial resources. They don't seem very up to date those either but still. However, Inkscape is not the correct tool to do application design. You can't really easily add standard elements such as drop shadows and correct borders, nor a proper way to have templates and so much more. It's not a Figma alternative. Then, well, there's Figma. <laughs> it is used by some people in designers. As an example, both Manuel and Andy use it on the KDE side of things. It's the status quo for this type of things, but it's also proprietary and we all would prefer to avoid it. Finally, there's Penpot. They are an open source alternative to Figma and they're developing quickly. KDE is trying to move to it over time, but they still lack many of the necessary resources to replace a tool like Figma. However, the team is very reactive and they are collaborating with the KDE Next project to address those missing features. There are no formal plans for GNOME to move to Penpot, however. There are a couple of fans who will try to push for it more, but most designers will probably be stuck with Inkscape for a while longer. If you want more details specifically about KDE Next and Penpot, I've already talked more about it in my video about KDE Next specifically, but you can also go check Andy's YouTube channel for more. Both KDE and GNOME have something called the Human Interface Guidelines. Those are supposed to contain some reference information for how to develop systems for their respective ecosystems. Cool. KDE guidelines have been recently rewritten by Nate Graham and has been then uh, further developed by many others. It begins with some philosophical <laughs> instructions. What makes a KDE app a KDE app? How to be simple by default but, but uh, powerful when needed? These kind of things. Then the categories you would expect. There's um, layout and navigation, displaying content, getting input, communications, uh, communicating status changes, text and labels, icons and accessibility. If you were wondering what makes a KDE app a KDE app, well, it's allowing for diverse workflows and adapting to preferences and not being afraid to grow to cover multiple different use cases. Keep these sentences in mind, as you will see that the GNOME guidelines have a somewhat different take on them. You can have some fun going through these sections. As one example, the KDE guidelines recommend against distinguishing between a basic and advanced in an application UI. This is because the word advanced communicates, communicates uh, nothing about what might be inside that section and the distinction between basic and advanced depends on the opinion of the user. GNOME guidelines also begin with design principles. These are designed for people and those accommodate, accommodating for different physical abilities, cultures and uh, device form factors. Also, make it simple. Resist the pull to try and make an app that suits all people in all situations. Focus on one situation, one type of experience. And the best app do one thing and do it well. This seems radically different from KD's principles. 
GNOME guidelines also include tools and resources. The former include applications to find icons, select text styles, preview app, icon, app icons and symbolic icons, and a reference application for the color palette. There's also a GTK inspector, like the web browser ones, but for GNOME apps, and a demo application for LibAdvaita. Adwaita, I don't know. Ah, and um, the above mentioned app SVG templates, which again, not kept up, kept up to date. I should have deleted this sentence. The rest of the guidelines, that is most of them, are divided between a subsection called guidelines, yes, uh, patterns, and references. Unsurprisingly, the patterns very closely reference LibreAdvaita, the library that GNOME uses to build applications. They also have very nice graphical elements to indicate the various chapters. I love that. Let's talk third-party app ecosystems. Though this topic isn't strictly about design, its quality is often a direct consequence of it. Are available APIs easy enough to for new developers to start using them? Do they have sensible designs out of the box? Are developers able to build more complex apps with them? Uh, this will be the topic of another video, but quickly, Kiri offers a library of application components called Kirigami. These include front-end UI elements from pages to buttons, actions, drawers, cards, form layouts, inline messages, and so on. But it also includes uh, spacing, colors, typography, typography, and so on. Similarly, GNOME offers a set of components, again called Libadoita. This also comes with a variety of UI elements, which are often direct implementation of their human interface guidelines. Libadoita thus makes it really easy to create a third-party apps following the GNOME design. So far, I feel uh, like GNOME is somewhat winning this battle, featuring a wider selection of applications with a consistent design. They've also started an initiative called the GNOME Circle, which is used to give direct feedback to third-party app developers to steer them towards the GNOME way of doing things and rewarding them with more resources. Finally, to do design, it's often very useful to have some data about how users interact with a certain system. This is called telemetry, and a proprietary application have no trouble inserting it everywhere. Open source projects, less so. KDE has opt-in telemetry system called KUser Feedback. User-wise, it's a slider, again, off by default, that lets you choose how much you want to share with KDE and provides a list of exactly what is being shared. Developer David Edmondson shared a few conclusions that were obtained thanks to this data. As an example, one time a developer claimed that no one is using a screen smaller than 1024 by 768, uh, but was then quickly proved wrong by the data. Similarly, no one still uses OpenGL2 was disproven that uh, 5% were. It also allowed KDE to track the usage of X11 versus Wayland. As you know, Plasma 6 recently switched from the former to the latter. Uh, did the users agree with this or had they um, had to switch back? Well, overall, the percentage of Wayland users is only at 45%, though it's increasing over time. However, if we filter by Plasma 6 only users, we see that 20, uh, sorry, only 20% decided to change the default from Wayland back to x11 these are a few there are sorry a few criticisms of this method too one that i have myself is that the vdg does not really use it or only uses it extremely rarely for privacy reasons only a few members have access to this data as an example i don't uh, secondly it's really hard to add new data to be tracked to the users who already opted in what should happen uh, should they be also automatically opted into the new tracking too, which wouldn't be honest towards them. Should they have to go back to settings to change the slider again? Should they be notified and asked upon upgrading? And if so, well, we have to implement that. <laughs> it's not clear. Gnome had a few more mixed feelings about telemetry. A while ago, they published a script called Gnome Info Collect that users could intentionally download and launch on their systems to share as a one-time favor some data to Gnome. Two and a half um, thousand people did so. Turns out most of the people who run the scripts use Fedora, uh, Arch is a distant second, and use a Lenovo computer. 
half of the online accounts features, sorry, half use the online accounts features mostly to connect to Google. 93% have Flatpak installed and 73% use Firefox as the default browser. Also, only less than 70% did not have any extension installed. They also looked for which extensions were installed and which apps the user had on their systems. The most common ones were GIMP, VLC and Steam. Overall, this feels like a very interesting exercise in data collection and one that might even result more useful compared to KDE's current telemetry system. However, for it to continue pro provide feedback, it would have to be run once in a while. There are benefits and issues on both sides, I would say. So, with that terrible one, I can't breathe. Ugh. With a terrible voice, I can't breathe. That was the best that I could do to very quickly compare how Kitty and, and Gnome do design. Let, let's just stop recording. Let's.